You're listening to The Edge with Mark Thompson. Hello and welcome. So good to have you here on the podcast. You know, we recorded this podcast for all the social unrest. And probably, I want to say it was 12 hours or so before just everything in America seemed to come apart. There was no sense that American cities would be ablaze, that the looting and the protests would all get wrapped together in the same bizarre mix that you'd lose track, in essence, of the purity and the righteousness and anger. I'm talking about righteous anger associated with the murder of George Floyd. That you'd lose that in what is a run for cover in American cities as Los Angeles and San Francisco and Minneapolis and New York and Chicago and Atlanta and Austin and San... You know, it it goes on and on. I've left out Denver and Reno. I mean, it just went from city to city. All at the same time, this protest turned violence and unrest. And it doesn't appear that a lot of that violence and that looting was associated with the protesters per se. Oftentimes, they were there and started things in a peaceful way. These were peaceful marches, admittedly informed by anger and frustration. And I think it's not just anger and frustration over what's clearly deep-seated issues in law enforcement, but also the haves and have-nots, the economic realities of America, leaving people in more and more desperate situations. All of that made worse by COVID-19 and record unemployment. And you begin to see how this is a momentum and a pent-up frustration that really was looking for an outlet. But all of that said, it was also viewed as an opportunity, an opportunity that was exploited by those taking advantage of these situations to loot and to destroy. I mean, I looked at so much of that video, and I saw young people running out of stores with every manner of stuff. And it's hard for me to ascribe anything but less than righteous motives to that, right? These aren't people who've, you know, toiled under the man for their entire lives, who have realized they don't have a chance in an America that is so full of the have-nots that that small group of haves is too far away. I, I don't accept that. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe no, they really do grow up as teenagers and realize they don't have a chance. But it seemed to me in the many moments, in in the many images, it seemed to me something else was going on. Outside agitators, clearly, they've now been officially identified. They don't identify the actual agitators, unfortunately, but they identify these organizations. But all I'm really getting at is that this erupted somewhat suddenly, even though you could say it was always building, off of the platform of the legitimate outrage associated with with the murder of George Floyd. So this episode, as I say, was recorded before all this happened. I mean, and I, I even held back the episode for a day. I thought, well, maybe I should, you know, try to get an, an additional guest on, or we should we should get Michael back. I have Michael Shore. I have J. Elvis Weinstein, Eddie Pepitone, and we talk about COVID-19 and life under this kind of lockdown that we were already a part of. But it may seem conspicuous to you that we don't talk about this other kind of lockdown that we in American cities are now living under. These curfews and these neighborhoods being burned out and violently taken over. I think the protest and the anger associated with looting, maybe there's some overlap, but ultimately I think the looting was stealing. Now, I've taken incredible grief on social media for sort of being less than progressive in this way, not somehow understanding and granting those who are looting the dignity associated with that kind of anger and violent rage that drove them to do this. But I have to tell you, I just think it's it's the wrong way to pursue it. And from what I saw, I mean, I saw a lady running from a cheesecake factory balancing a cheesecake as she ran. Kids running from stores from San Francisco to Los Angeles to Manhattan, and they're they're balancing all of this other stuff, everything from Apple Watches to Converse tennis shoes. It was, now maybe I sound to you like an old white guy, and maybe that's what I am. You can tell me that, but I'm so outraged and frustrated by allowing cops to get away with shooting people, also allowing law enforcement to overstep their bounds time and time again. And what is a clear, and I just don't know how, on a percentage basis, how much of the force 
is racist, but there is a clear implicit racism just based on statistics that the black community has to deal with when it comes to law enforcement. So I'm aware of that. Again, I've been lit up by the progressives for not understanding how economic frustration and other elements fueled the looting. I don't. So maybe you can tell me more about that. I understand the economic frustration we talked about in this show. In fact, the next guest is going to talk to you in the next episode about the bailout and how it's really a fraud, the bailout. And I've been saying that for since they happened. It's a top-down bailout. It's a corporate looting. I talk about the greatest looting of the American treasury in history by corporate America, by the richest people, by the people connected to Donald Trump and by Trump himself. But I'm sorry, I didn't see that informing the looting that went on over the weekend in America and has produced the curfews and the kind of law enforcement presence that we're now seeing on American streets. All right, I'll shut up. I guess I was just trying to explain this episode from this point forward is going to talk about COVID-19. We'll also talk about the politics of COVID-19 and the politics of the moment and Trump. And Michael Shore, to his credit, at the very end of the conversation, he mentions Minneapolis and George Floyd. And to his credit, I mean, I thought as I listened to the episode back before I'm posting it now, I thought, wow, I mean, who would have thought that that would crowd out COVID-19, this very thing? But in a way, it's good that it did. This murdering of this black man, that turned into enough of a controversy. So now that's all we're talking about. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all the ways you support us. Thank you for the reviews. You know, I've, re- I've removed all my requests for money at the beginning of these shows. I know these are tough times. So the way you can support us is to give us five-star reviews and just a, a line or two going enjoy the show or catch it when I can, whatever you want to say. So thank you for that. Subscriptions really help just keep us alive in the, in the universe of podcasts. All right, let's get started. This is the edge. The advantage, it means. They look, I just spit on me for no reason. That's horrible. Is there some comfort in uncertainty, do you think? You're a degenerate. Because Australian Shepherds need action. Wow. Yeah. This is the edge. That's a self-loathing term that I use. For. Oh, got it. Jay Elvis is on the line. As we are want to do, Jay Elvis, we welcome in as much as we can get him you know he's very tough to get a hold of oftentimes but he's our political maven he's our political dude he's michael shore everybody oh, i'm michael shore you. how yeah. are you guys you know mark you always <laughs> open up with you're very tough last night i got a text saying can you do these two things yes i mean there's no tough anymore i'm not uh, i'm not on the road as much as i was Oh, that's true. Yeah, he used to be on the road with all the campaigns and the primaries, but now everybody is um, hunkering down. How does a guy like you, a political guy, you're doing all this stuff, I'm following blogs, and you're following this and following that, you have all this information coming into you constantly, Michael Shore. Do you get that all delivered to you under the bed while you're hiding? Are you not hiding? Are you trying to lead your life? Here's what I've done. I've restarted my paper subscriptions to newspapers because I'm home. Uh, and uh, I was always canceling and suspending and, you know, so, oh, we're not going to be here for these days and those days. So I just gave them up. I canceled them. And now that I have them back, uh, it, uh, you know, I, I nursed them throughout the day, which is nice. I love the newspaper. And I know that's because I'm old. Isn't that right, Jay Elvis? I mean, you don't, do you get a paper? Yeah, we still get the LA Times here in paper form. I just like it. There's something, I also find articles in the paper that I do not find on the digital offerings. Well, and it's not just that they're, I'm sure they're there, but you just don't go deep enough on the digital. And and it is kind of a tactile experience reading the paper. You know, you, you go, you reference it, you come back to it, you check. I, I don't know. Um, I think it has to do with old, too, but I, but I don't think that's a negative either. I think that you sort of immerse yourself in it a little better. You're not getting a text at the top of the screen that you're reading your paper on. And that. I don't know. <laughs> that's a good point. That is true. Yeah. I'm so distracted by various – I'm reading something that goes, and then there'll be some CNN advisory. Oh, I want to see what the hell's going on with that. Yeah. If anything, it's a gesture to the universe, really, at this point. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Very true. Uh, I subscribe to a bunch of papers that I don't even check in on regularly just because I'm trying to support them. But, boy, it's been uh, – COVID-19 has been brutal to the journalism business and to the newspaper business. No question. I just like the clutter. It is true. You know, <laughs> J. Elvis is right because my place, when I'm getting – 
all the papers delivered, it starts to look like you know, the Library of Congress or something with everything just stacking up. And then when I go to throw them away, I go, oh, no, 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 I want to read that. That's a, that's a profile of that uh, designer I want to read about, you know, whatever. It's just like nothing gets thrown away. That yeah, you're thinking they're that. usually a part of any hoarder's landscape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, it is a sort of boilerplate hoarder thing. I think I might have some other issues. Yeah, here's uh, my other thing that I've only subscribed to them Monday through Friday. So that that sensation that you're talking about, Mark, was like, oh, I can't throw that away because I didn't read about the designer. You have Saturday and Sunday to do that, which is great for the clutter because it can accumulate all week. But also, there's no there is a break till the next clutter arrives. Too. Oh. Right. But, I mean, then you look at these newspapers like the New York Times, which has a, you know, storied Sunday paper. You know, you could take all week just reading the Sunday New York Times. You could. That's the thing. And I don't find that, you know, not having the Sunday Times while the Sunday Times is nice. It's also OK to read the rest of Thursdays on Sunday, you know, <laughs> and it's fun. I see that. I see that. All right. Let's talk some politics. What's going on politically? There's a political race uh, and a primary coming up in Iowa, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, there are a lot, a lot of those postponed primaries postponed to June 2nd. And you'll remember four years ago or nine years ago, whenever they suspended primaries, they moved them all to June 2nd and some to June 9th. So one of the interesting ones, I mean, the presidential primaries don't hold, obviously, a lot of interest. We have a presumptive nominee on the Democratic side. And, of course, the president was virtually unchallenged. But there are some congressional races that have been interesting. One of them is in Iowa next week, and it's Steve King. You'll, you'll note uh, the sort of virulent anti-immigrant and sort of outcast Republican member of Congress who was stripped for some of his remarks of his committee assignments and, and has a rancorous relationship with Kevin McCarthy as the minority leader in the House. He's up for re-election and as is the whole House, but he has a primary, but he's being primaried by three or four people. So whenever there's a primary, the incumbent always looks better with the more people that there are, and he's going to face J.D. Shulton, the Democrat in the fall, who only lost lost to King by three points in 2018. So this is a race to watch. And, you know, Shulton and a lot of the Democrats in Iowa are in this weird position of rooting for Steve King on Tuesday because they think he will be the easier, and they're right, the easier opponent. But he has no guarantee that even if he does win re-election, he's going to get committee assignments again. So he's just this sort of pariah in Washington. Oh, that's really interesting. Right. And I would imagine that's part of the campaign, right? Which is sort of like, even if you elect this guy, he's going to be, he's just going to be an empty suit in there. Unquestionably. And he's saying that McCarthy, he has a transcript of a phone call with McCarthy uh, that uh, that he recorded. That McCarthy said he never said these things, but, but King is alleging that McCarthy said he'll get his committee assignments back uh, in the next Congress, which that you're right, Mark. I mean, that's what he's trying to bank on. But McCarthy says that's not the case. You know, we hear about these uh, about flipping a seat and, you know, these all these districts that can get flipped. Where is the flipping possible? Like what races to watch for flippage? Well, I mean, flippage in the House or flippage in the Senate? I mean, there's there's plenty of flippage in the Senate that looks even more likely for Democrats than it did before which, again, you know, we've talked about, would Elizabeth Warren be a good running mate? Well, Massachusetts would have to change their law, as other states have, to make sure that the governor appoints someone from the same party. And if they don't change that law, it'll be very difficult for the Democrats to want to put Warren on the ticket with a Republican governor in Massachusetts, because they have a good shot at the Senate now by flipping uh, Colorado by flipping Maine, which looks increasingly likely for them. Uh, the polling uh, in Susan Collins state is is not good for her uh, by flipping perhaps Montana. Certainly Arizona is in there. And now one of the seats in Georgia. There's so much out there that get in North Carolina and South Carolina. Even Lindsey Graham's seat is not a gimme, although, it, you know, a lot of these do lean Republican. So, that's where you see some flippage. In the House side, you had a bunch of House members who were you know, Democrats who won in Trump districts from New York to Pennsylvania to Michigan and Minnesota. Some of those people are going to have tougher races. It doesn't seem, though, like anything has changed politically that's going to make any but a few of those states flip back, a few of those seats flip back. So I, I don't see the House flipping right now, especially in light of the fact that the virus is tied to the Trump administration, the handling of the virus, and it's not falling very well right now, still five months, which is, as we know, a lifetime. If the market comes back, but the virus comes back, the market's already, you know, as of this episode, 
the market's doing really well because it's disconnected from Main Street, primarily because they're just shoving so much money into all of these corporations. It's remarkable. And this is a so, so that's one reason. Anyway, so the market's back and uh, but the job numbers languish a little bit and the coronavirus, the second wave, and we're not even done with the first wave yet, that's also up. How is that playing in the general election for Trump? And, and how does that spill over into some of these other races to which you referred? Are we talking to me still? Because I'd love, I, I want to make this a... Uh... Yeah, it's a family conversation. Yeah. Jay Ellis has got some clean takes on this stuff, too. Oh, you know right. me and my market rap. Um, I th- but I do think, the, I mean, I think the market is disconnected from the economy completely because I just, I really feel like because of the way interest rates and banks are sitting, there's nowhere else to put your money. But in the market, everyone who pulled it out needs somewhere to put it. Right. But that's yeah. rich people with money. <laughs> you know, so right. No, and the most, most Americans aren't in the market. I mean, they're in it maybe in right. their retirement account, but they're not traders. Yeah, they aren't you know. controlling it. Yeah. And historically, the market has been up when the economy has been up. Now the market is up and the economy is not. And that's when Main Street matters, because in an election year, most people are feeling a pinch. I mean, but with, you know, exponentially more than any other election we've been alive for are feeling a pinch. And I I do think that that's going to matter in this election because you, you can have the market be up as far as it is. But you also have people unsure of when they're going to have rent to pay or when they're going to have rent to collect. And and that that's the Main Street part. That's the disconnect right there. And never before has a terrible economy reelected a president. I mean, even, you know, Barack Obama in 2008, when he was running against John McCain, McCain was actually up. And then then, you know, when when Lehman Brothers went under and then when Bear Stearns went under and we went to that tailspin of an economy uh, under a Republican president, it catapulted Barack Obama because they thought somebody different would be better at dealing with the economy than more of the same, which John McCain was as a Republican. So it, it really this is an unusual situation. But like you guys have both said, the market is not something that most voters on Main Street and most voters who were new to the process last time and voted for Donald Trump uh, are most of the new voters I'm saying uh, are, are tied are not tied to the market as much as they are tied to their jobs, to their 401ks, which are maybe doing okay, but their jobs are more important. And then they have rents and in in many cases, mortgages, it's just, uh, it's untenable. So you're saying with the economy in that state, it's likely that incumbency just will not carry the day. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, it, you know, if you go by historical models, right? Uh, but again, there's no and that's model with for competent presidents, pseudo competent presidents, no, right? <laughs> exactly. And then there's the pandemic. So as a standalone, a country in crisis where the crisis is not being handled popularly, it makes it even more difficult. And a president is not able to go out and campaign as he had uh, when that is his stock and trade. Much more. I mean, look, every politician it's about campaigning but 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 donald trump does it in a way that others haven't in the numbers that he gets and the attention that those rallies inevitably get so he's not able to do that it's hard to change the tide of public opinion just because the market's doing better and look joblessness is better it's in the numbers are horrendous but new claims Actually, even though they went up, they went uh, they went up by less than last time, which means some businesses, as the country begins to reopen, are hiring again, which is good and which is good for the country. And it's good for the president. It's good for the economy. But people really don't have a lot of money to spend in the economy right now. So, you know, restaurants, yes, they may reopen, but people don't have money to eat out with now. So that you have to be able to put money back into the economy as little as I know about money uh, in order to make it function. Well, yeah. And, the, and that restaurant can only operate at 33% capacity right now. So they're not they're not hiring back their staff. Yeah. I always think it would be the dream to have your own restaurant, but now all of a sudden the dream becomes this nightmare because as Jay Elvis says, you can't socially distance and have the sufficient numbers of people in your establishment to pay the rent. Yeah, it is a tight yeah. margin business. It's a really, really tight margin business. And a lot of these restaurants are going to go away. And we say restaurants because, you know, restaurants, service industry, people are associated with the restaurants. I mean, they're they're waiters and they're waitresses. And do they still go waiter and waitress? Like actor and actress is now gone. You're supposed to just go actor, you know. I think server. Server. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Um, what are the so- Academy Awards 
change like best supporting act? Like, why do they separate women and men? Well, the reason that they do everything on the Academy Awards is because it's all just a show and they're just no, trying no, to promote, yeah. promote. Okay, no, no, but but the more categories that are glamorous with those people, the the better. I mean, if you're saying, right. you know, is there is there some sort of fair-minded reason? Maybe. I mean, I guess they, you know, distinguish uh, best actor in a comedy from best actor in a drama, and they, you know, because it's not fair to compare uh, apples and oranges. But you're already comparing apples and oranges when you're comparing somebody who's in The Revenant to somebody who is in, you know, Goodfellas, or I don't know. And give me a more contemporary right. reference. <laughs> yeah. Both very uh, violent choices. Send me a reference, God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, Jungle yeah. Book. <laughs> Jungle Book. Thank you. <laughs> Moana. Uh, any Moana? Any other uh, uh, questions? Academy Award questions? I'd be happy to field them now. Yeah, I knew that was your uh, your go to. Uh, no, I don't have any. I didn't have one when I uh, when I got on the on the podcast today. The either, uh, Jay Elvis, do you have any Academy Award questions? I'd be happy to. Or anything about American institutions that you've been troubled by? I'd be happy. I can handle anything. Absolutely anything. Uh, I'm a little worried about uh, HBO Max. Oh, no, I'm really not. <laughs> <laughs> You know, HBO Jay and I had a great Mark J. Elvis and I had a great Twitter exchange a couple of weeks ago uh, where we learned uh, or I learned and he learned about me that we're both emergency fans. The show in the uh, in the 70s. The, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Paramedic we went, show. We went like we went about eight characters deep in our banter. <laughs> who yeah, uh, who was in emergency? Who wasn't? Well, you, had uh, your, you had your Randolph Mantooth. You had your Kevin Ty. You right. Had your Bobby then, but, you know, the, yeah, uh, Bobby. Uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, yeah, Bobby Fuller and Bobby Troop. Jeez. Uh, Who are these people? So, I don't even know. Bobby Troop was, what, 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 thing, yeah. actually. I think the most famous of them actually was Bobby Troop. Although, I mean, he at wasn't the time, because of, I, at so, the time, going I think, in, yeah. going in. But uh, I think uh, I think you know, in terms of Kevin Ty was really the only one whose career actually flourished as a as a character actor. Yeah, uh, Randolph Mantooth, though I think went on to a, a soap opera for many years. So maybe I, you know you can judge that in in terms of who has the bit bigger bank account. I don't know if it was Randy yeah, or Kevin. Let's look them both up on Zillow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I, I think there, I think both of, I think Mantooth and Ty are still with us, but I don't think the other, the, the, I don't think the medical staff is. This is a, no, this is a remarkably. Robert Fuller, Robert Fuller has to be gone by now. He's gone, yeah, and so too is Bobby Troop and and Dixie uh, McCall, Julie London. Oh also. my, Julie London, thank you. That was the one that I forgot. I, I never saw the show, but I mean, I really, I know it was on, but I just never was a fan. I, how did you not watch that show? And even looking at the clips, I'm again. It takes me back to uh, clicking past it. My brother had dolls, and I won't even say action figures. They were dolls of Johnny Gage and Roy DeSoto. Yeah, I, my friend Brad and I used to pretend my father had a red Jeep, and we used to pretend that was uh, you know Squad Fifty One, and uh, you know we'd reenact uh, Emergency. We were DeSoto and uh, and Gage. Your father had a so, red Jeep. He did have a red Jeep. Yeah, that's the I mean, coolest a, thing ever. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, it was good. We had a powder blue station wagon. What did you have, Jay Elvis? My dad liked the big American, uh, like Chrysler New York Brougham. <laughs> <laughs> the Brougham. I think it was a New Yorker, wasn't it? The New Yorker. Oh uh, yeah, it was the it was the New York Brougham is what his was. The yeah. New Yorker Brougham was yes. yeah. the uh, hard top convertible version. Oh, oh that. So good. Yeah, no that's really posts. cool. Yeah. We had a much more um, low-key existence in my house. Well, the problem guys... with it is you needed, the, you needed the tugboats to bring you into the garage. <laughs> 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 All right, got to wrap up. I have to ask you a question that I will probably ask you again, but I'm curious. Yes, I love you, Mark. <laughs> All right, that's yes, two questions. We, yeah, it's yeah. the best podcast. Yeah. Let's say Donald Trump loses the election. He very likely, I would think, sets fire to the place, right? He pardons everybody, that's of course. But he could easily get into some kind of hot war with China in the South China Sea or get into some kind of armed conflict without 
the prospect of re-election no, any longer being a possibility, or, and this is, I think, as much a possibility, challenge the election results regardless of how big a drubbing he might take. Challenge the election uh, well, result. Yeah, that's a multi-part question. We'll go, we'll go through it quickly. First of all, he will challenge the election result in some regard. Whether or not it holds water depends on the size of the victory. He's already doing it. He's setting the table for that by opposing mail-in voting. So uh, you can see that happening already by putting a cloud of doubt over the veracity of those votes. It's, it's setting that up for himself. But I think that as his popularity wanes and even wanes sharply as it gets closer to November, should that happen, you're going to see a party that's going to go away from him a little bit and uh, ahead of an election if they find him to be toxic in any way. They haven't done that yet. We've predicted it would happen before I have, and it hasn't. But, you know, now we're down to the wire. And if the numbers are just terrible, you're going to see people having to get away from him, which makes him doing anything like that increasingly difficult. He also has a Democratic House. Look, he's the president. He can do a lot without having to go to Congress. He can circumvent Congress on the War Powers Act. But here's something really interesting, too. Iran is now dialing down their interaction with the United States because they don't want Donald Trump to have something to hang his hat on when it comes to an international conflict uh, to get people to support him here at a time of conflict. So Iran is saying, let's just let's just cool down for a little while. Let's wait. Let's hope a Democrat wins in the United States, get back to an Iran nuclear deal and fix things a little bit more. We're not getting anywhere with Trump. So you even see the world looking fascinating. One thing we should hit on, too, is you know this horrible George Floyd thing that's happened in Minnesota with the Minneapolis police um, killing him, basically. Um, not basically killing him. Um, is yeah. Donald Trump is now saying that he's going to put the full force of the Justice Department into looking into what happened there. By doing that, what he's doing is looking at some of these subtle poll numbers that people aren't paying really close attention to, some of which show that young African-American support for Joe Biden is not nearly as strong as it is among older African-Americans and much less strong than it was even for Hillary Clinton or markedly less strong anyway. So he's trying to capitalize on a situation which is smart politics, and that's where he's going to try and make his differences. He's going to try and make differences along the margins again as he runs for office, going to war and doing something crazy that is perceived as crazy like that or starting a conflict alienates some of the new voters he's trying to invite into his tent. So it, there's a lot at play, a lot of fine lines. The basic premise, though, is that he's an unpopular president, and the closer it gets, he's going to be unpopular among people in his party, too. Especially if he keeps giving them cover, like the Joe Scarborough thing, where they can safely tell him to stop. You know? Yeah, that's true. That's really true, except only one of them did. You know, Mitt Romney was the only one who did. You know, there was a congressman, too, but no one cared. Yeah, no, right, right, right. But there was not this sort of, you know, massive group of nine senators deploring what the president said. So no, but there was the New York Post and there was the Wall Street Journal. and there were, you know. Yeah, no question. It has to keep happening. And it will if endangered senators start seeing that attaching themselves to the president at a time where the president's popularity ahead of an election is not good, then you'll see more of that, I would guess. I mean, it, traditionally you have. And the Republican Party, the moment he loses, if that's what happens, is not going to be the party of Trump anymore. There will still be loud Trump voices there, but they're going to say, well, this didn't work. And they're going to have to look at themselves again. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think the fact that he's in you know, a settling score mode right now, like Michael Corleone after the baptism, is, yeah. you know, is, a, is a sign that he sees his time is short. Right. I would agree. Do you have any questions about Michael Corleone? I can answer those also. I fully <laughs> was versed he in the uh, nominated, nominated. Right. He won sense of a woman, I know, but oh yeah, yeah, yeah. God, can you imagine that that overacting associated with that? And he won sense of a woman. <laughs> Eight times nominated for an Academy Award, Al Pacino. Um, Man of a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Always a delight, Jay Elvis. A great delight. Like and when that. I say I just want to distinguish it doesn't mean it wasn't a great delight for you, Michael. Sometimes I feel like awkward now because I said you were a delight and he's a great delight. I didn't mean to. I'm not comparing. I'm just saying it, well, frankly, it was a delight. Frankly, I think I, I tried harder to delight. <laughs> opposed to Michael. Michael tried to inform, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah maybe. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you make a good point. Jay Elvis. No offense, Michael, but he was more delightful, maybe. And you were more informative. 
Yeah. But that was your, your charge to be informative. So you kind of left the delight to him. In fact, I think probably you could have been more delightful, but you left it out to allow Jay Elvis to fill the yeah, void of delight. I, I see it as nothing but Jenner. It was, it was I mean, this is, uh, I have to rethink everything I do here. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's not a comfortable place to be. Yeah, imagine how I feel. Michael well, Shore, okay. everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Michael. Thank you. Next week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing the Terry Jack song, Seasons in the Sun, next week. I, yeah, please. Uh, all the references you can make to emergency, too, if you could. Let's uh, start on the emergency theme. <laughs> Bye, boys. Bye. Bye. Hi, how are you? I want to thank you for supporting Mark Thompson here on the Edge Radio. Fantastic show with all the jokes and Jay Elvis, you know, and all the commentary and the politics and the bullshit. You can listen to this on iTunes or Stitcher, or you can just go to the damn website, edge-show.com. Stupid. Why is that dash? Edge-show.com. Stupid. Why is that dash? I love it. Love it rolling around with my, um, my masters of mirth, the kings of comedy. Uh, How many alliterations? I was looking for another one. It's J. Elvis Weinstein and Eddie Pepitone. Uh, Eddie hasn't been on the show, and I want to say it's been years since you've been on the show, Eddie. What happened to your co-host, Heather, Mark? Yes, yes. I thought you had a co-host. I did. Heather Heather was and is uh, lovely. And Heather, and we used to give her endless shit about this, she met this dude, and yeah. he ended up being a guy who was arrested and convicted for a white-collar crime. It was a, like a, you phoned up some bank records. And honestly, he was, and he served time in a federal penitentiary. Now, she wow. remained faithful to him and, like, you know, waited for him and visited him in the pen. And oh my God. I know, I know. I know we used to give her, you know, as I say, just endless grief about it. And they reunited outside the pen when he got out. And now she moved with him to Northern California. And she's living the life just south of San Francisco. I should wow. add for the record that that we actually do like this guy, too. He's a pretty cool guy, despite oh, his he criminal is, past. He's absolutely the coolest. Yeah, I'm so sorry. You're right in telling it. I was just kind of... <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, anybody who's been to the big house is cool in my book. <laughs> oh, you know, you know what you realize, especially during this administration, sorry to, you know, come yeah. out of the closet on not being such a big fan of, of what's going on in Washington now in this administration. Uh, but just in general, is you realize that so many people who are in white collar kind of, of situations of fraud or other, how they skate. I mean, there are a bunch of people that are skating on all kinds of crap. Oh, it happens all the time. Oh. So when this dude is nailed for five and a half years or whatever, you realize the arbitrariness of that, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, the guy in charge, he should be in jail 30 times over, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. he's right. But anyway, these are controversial statements. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> that is look, this COVID-19, <laughs> have you heard about it? It's really... Yeah. Um, it's really uh, affected things, you know? Let me just give you one positive, because it's pretty awful, the whole thing. There's a few but, of them, though. There's a few positives, I got to tell you. Oh, well, I can think of one, and that is that, for example, you're available to do my podcast, okay? I mean, because <laughs> you're shut in. Yeah, yeah that's true. You want to hear another one? It's teaching everybody in one form or another humility, because there is such narcissism that runs rampant in this country, and now we realize that we are just specks of dust at the mercy of forces beyond our control. Thank you, everybody. Please vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you won't see that on any bumper stickers. It's not exactly. That, that sounds like the most temporary effect of all of them, probably. <laughs> if <it's... laughs> probably. Probably. If it's real. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you what. I don't find a, a great deal of humility. I think you're right. Those who think about it, it kind of reminds you of how we're all linked, how we have no control, yeah. how recklessness yeah. when it comes to the planet and the way we treat things on the planet, how... You know, yeah. you need to pay the piper on that. You can't just do that, yeah. Scott. You can't get away from it. But I, I don't know that those things are really reflected upon. Unfortunately, we just as a species, we're more immediate and we're looking for immediate gratification. I don't know that that greater humility is something that a lot of people realize. But 
it's attacked to the uh, I have it worse than you flank of narcissism. Ah, yeah. I have it worse than you narcissism. Yeah. What amazes me since I've been on Instagram doing my thing is just seeing the people who post, you know, videos of themselves dancing and looking gorgeous. And it's like, Really? Do you guys have any inkling of the word suffering? And I I don't know. I feel like there's a segment of people that should suffer. And I know that's controversial. (laughs) (laughs) You think that's controversial, do you? I think think you... I think it's never been more easy to sort them out because if you can see their mouth and nose, they're in that group. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yes. That's right. This yes. mask thing, I never would have thought that a public health crisis that can be addressed in some way, at least in small measure, by the masking up, I never thought that that would yeah. become political, but it has. Yeah. I was talking to a friend about it, and he was claiming that it's a machismo, you know, that a lot of people don't want to wear a mask. It's like, fuck you, I'm bigger than this disease, and fuck you, you're not going to tell me what to do. You know what I mean? It's like That's a real absolutely right. That's mm-hmm. absolutely right. Yeah, I, like, when you see the, the marches on the state, we talked about this in the last episode a little bit, Jay Elvis, about the taking over of the state house in Michigan with, you know, they've got, you've got guys with American flags and guns. I mean, a lot of them, not just a few of them. Same thing in Sacramento. You know, you, you, they, they show up and, and that is a displaced machismo with a, uh, the defiance, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? The sense that you can, Hey, you can't tell me to blank. I'm an American. This is a free country. So you can't tell me to, uh, that I can't do X in this case, go out or me or whatever, or not have a gun or whatever. There, there really, there's a sense of, I don't want the government to tell me anything. It's sort of reg- not taking regard for the fact that we're all in this together. So there is sort of a covenant that we all have to have as to how we get along in a society, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry I fell asleep during that. Um, but yes. <laughs> um, that's absolutely right. That is absolutely right. Now, you know, this is funny because Eddie on stage, Jay Elvis, he does a lot of this. He will he will rage against the corporate machine. I mean, he really will. And he'll I'm, he'll do I'm it. And well then he'll aware. he'll pivot then to some kind of like more typical mainstream comedic thing for a little yeah. while. And there's a sort of a comedy moment in that. It's pretty it's pretty it, it, I, you don't see it a lot, you know. Yeah, you can only give the masses, you know, enlightenment as far as political enlightenment in very small doses and then go back and talk about the vagaries between men and women. (laughs) (laughs) It's brutal, though. There's so much room for comedy because it is so grim and you just can find these comedic moments. What is the outlet now? Because you don't have a live performance venue any longer. Well, I do a podcast like you do. So that's a bit of an outlet. And, um, you know... I do all kinds of video. You know, with the technology, you know, it's really interesting. And they're saying because of the pandemic and who the hell knows what's going to happen. But the technology is leading, you know, being able to produce stuff in your in your own domicile is quite interesting. You know, I mean, of course, I do miss the live element. That's that's the big one. Obviously. I did a uh, web uh, stand up show for Acme Comedy Club in Minneapolis the other night. And while it's not stand-up, it doesn't feel like being in a club. It does. It does feel like, as Kindler would say, a third thing. It's uh, yes, yes. You know, it's Uh, still a communication. You know, there was 200 people, and Jackie Cation unmuted like 20 of them. So you weren't just going, "Is this thing on?" But you know, uh, but it was still the same exchange of joke and energy. You know. Yes, I've done them too. You know, if you're trying to one up me, you got the wrong guy. But I, um, I, I wanted to say, you know what, Jay Elvis, you know, and Mark, I know Mark is there. You know what we've all become? We've become Rupert Pumpkin because we're performing to nobody in our fucking basement. Yes. But at the same time, mass communication has just become everything is a podcast essentially now, too. (laughs) I know, I know, I know. And and you have a real dedicated audience, both of you guys. Eddie, of course, you're doing the Edinburgh Comedy Festival, and and Jay Elvis, you're doing all these comedy festivals and all these documentary films. All of it's been shut down, is the point. But you have followings that will come seek you out. Like if you, you know, 
if you raise the flag and say, I'm doing an Instagram thing, you do have people there. So you at least get that feedback is my point. But the problem comes is the profit model, you know, just to exist, you need to make some money. I just don't know where that comes in. Uh, yeah, that, that, well, we'll see, you know, we'll see as time goes on what it's going to be, if not, you know. Are they reopening any of the clubs? Have you heard? I mean, w- was there any kind of well, even preliminary timeline or? What I heard is that the improv in Hollywood, now I heard this, I don't know if this is true, because I, the guy I heard this from uh, took his own life. But the guy I heard this from, I'm kidding. That is a very dark joke. I knew and, you were uh, kidding, but I, uh, it's, I, I laughed to help I, I, the I audience. Say, <laughs> I want to say, I want to say that that dark joke didn't make any sense, and I'm glad you laughed. But I did hear that the improv was going to open at first to 25% capacity, but I still don't know how that's going to fucking work. Everybody's going to have masks on. Is it before we're going to have masks on? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, they actually talk about, you know, they go through all these different things that I've read and like, for example, in choirs or laughter or these things where you tend to expel air through your, you know, throat and mouth, you are, I guess there's all this microscopic particulate matter and that could carry the vibe. You know, you, you're like, oh my God, it's just, I mean, these situations that are so much fun, like being in a comedy club, you know, any enclosed space, you're just laughing there. So, yeah, that gets to be a little sketchy. Yeah, I'm not right. looking forward to standing in front of people and, and trying to get them to expectorate in my direction, really. <laughs> you become really uh, targets, is what you become. Yeah. Receptacles. Yeah. Neither of those, yeah, are, right. neither of those are new, however. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You know, my buddy who I tour with, JT Haversat, is dying to get out there. He says, he, JT says things like, I don't really miss the performing as much. I just miss the, the, the camaraderie and doing it and getting there and <laughs> I, he, the adventure of it is what he says. I miss the adventure of it, you know? And he's you know, telling me this while I'm doing a puzzle of the Grand Canyon and feeling <laughs> great. I always thought... One of the great things, and it's kind of why I like to like head out late at night. I'll ask Eddie, are you playing a set somewhere? It's like 11, 15, 11, 30 at night. I love that. I mean, I, lo- I think there yeah. is a magical dynamic to the camaraderie, to the, to the group. I-, I really am envious of that. that. You know, I come out of a broadcast background. Never, I mean, there's a different camaraderie, but not like that, man. There's something like a, when you're at a nightclub and yeah. there's that. It- it's just yeah. really special, you know? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for making me feel like now I, now I am now I am missing something deeply. Yeah. Let me and tell it's you gone. how great heroin is too, Eddie. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's like an orgasm for an hour. <laughs> oh. Yeah, man. It's intense. It's an intense adrenaline rush, you know, and now I do puzzles of the Grand Canyon and there's so much of the Grand Canyon that looks the same. So it's a very, <laughs> very difficult puzzle. And, uh, uh, yeah, quick note on the Grand Canyon, if we can, everybody. Uh, it, it's too similar. <laughs> yeah. And after the COVID thing, can we kind of give it some texture and some contour? I did a jigsaw puzzle of a couch, so maybe I'm not even thinking big enough. No, 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 no. But so I don't know. I don't know how we're going to monetize it, you know, yet. Well, I mean, I'm doing a private show. I'm doing a private show for friends this week, like really good friends, and they've started to invite other friends. So it's kind of grown on Zoom. And uh, I'm charging $15 a head, and uh, I'm going to make pretty good money, you know, uh, doing this. So that's one way, I guess. I just put out the word. My friends were like, oh, do this for, you know, this one and this one. And they've started inviting people, and that's pretty cool. You know, I, I love that. I do, love that. That That's a great yeah. business model, actually. Yeah. I mean, given the circumstance. I'm going to take that money. I will, it's just exactly what I did with my stimulus. I got a stimulus check. I drove it straight to Vegas. I put it on seven. I didn't win, but I drove yeah. straight back. And I love you know, the attitude, uh, though. Yeah, turn it into real money. <laughs> 
Oh, boy. We have fun on these podcasts, don't we? <laughs> I get what you did there because you're not having fun, so you drew attention to the fact that you're not having fun. No, no, no. I, I, I drew attention to the fact that was, that, that was kind of a joke that didn't go anywhere. But, I see. <laughs> I uh, see. I see. You know what I have, though, and this drives Jay Elvis crazy, is I have the, yeah, see, I've got canned applause. So yeah, uh, right. whenever, whenever you feel you need it, just ask me, and I'll, and I'll run it for you. But well, Jay Elvis is browbeating know, me Mark, to Mark, not Mark, use it. Mark, Mark believes in bringing the worst parts of radio back to podcasting. Oh, that is, that, I, 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 I resent that. I resent that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, he took a big swipe at you. And uh, I, I feel like you should be like a good footman or valet and uh, know when we need it, you know, anticipate our needs. <laughs> you're right, no, you're know right. what? Well, I, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to say, hey, Mark, can you cue the lap? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, you're right. I really, <laughs> that's something I should already be hip to. You're absolutely right. You need to, uh, you need to put a little more Fred de Cordova into your head. Okay. Oh, very nice. <laughs> very nice. Nice reference. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, hey, did you know that Mrs. Fred de Cordova? I read a huge thing on in Vanity Fair about her. So Fred yeah. de Cordova, for people who don't know, he used to be the executive producer of The Tonight Show uh, with Johnny Carson. And they went around town like, you know, they were just the couple. I didn't know this. Again, this is the Vanity Fair piece. But I guess they've been everywhere. The Polo Lounge in Beverly Hills and to all the Spago and all this other stuff. Anyway, mm -hmm. when he passed away, she still mm -hmm. was going around town like she was a big deal. And slowly yeah. the town was kind of moving past her and she apparently didn't have any money she spent it all the, the story of what? mrs de cordova yeah is and oh, they wow. lived in truesdale estates i mean they had a lot of dough you know she used to walk around in fur all the time which made which instantly you know uh made me uh, Ooh, yeah right. exactly i was yeah, yeah no that sounds that sounds like some gray gardens kind of shit though yes thank you that's exactly what it was yeah. anyway, <laughs> oh you made me man gray gardens not only a great documentary, but a terrific salad dressing put out by those two <laughs> lunatics. <laughs> um, and all the proceeds goes to uh, mental health for the isolated rich. But what the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? Did she spend all that money? Because that's more money than God, than Fred DeCorvita made on The Tonight Show. I guess she did. How the fuck I did guess she, she spent spend that? How did she spend all that money? Absolutely crazy. You know, people don't realize, or, you know, forget maybe, that there were three stations, essentially, three networks, no options but to watch something on television if you were going to watch something. The Tonight Show was giant, and if you're executive producer, you're making serious oh. loot. Yeah. Wait, so what happened? Is there a good... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Jay. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying that there's a lot of people in Hollywood who set up very lavish lifestyles that are entirely based on income always coming. Yeah. The Vanity Fair yeah. piece, they called her the Duchess of Truesdale. Truesdale's a very, <laughs> uh, really bougie place to live. You know, you hear about Beverly Hills and Bel Air, but Truesdale's right. like where Elvis lived, I think. And, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's it? very... Where is it? Where it's is above it? Sunset, where Sunset goes from West Hollywood to Beverly Hills. It's right oh, above yeah. that, right on that bend, right above. Yeah. I was just thinking that if anybody ever gives you a nickname that sounds like a documentary title, run away from it. <laughs> yeah, the Duchess of yeah. the Duchess of Truesdale. Come on, I want to make that movie now. You know, there sounds like there's old fashioned, like medieval knights, like the Knights of Truesdale guard the entrance. No, you yeah. know what I mean. Like it, it, it just sounds uh, like a throwback, a throwback section of L.A. You know, is this Vanity Fair piece re recent on her? No, no, no. It was years ago. I just remember reading it. And when Jay Elvis mentioned Freddie de Cordova, I just remembered that. And she was a oh. big, I mean, she was a socialite, like a super socialite, obviously, I mean, right. given her. You know. right. And she wanted a list, a crowd. That was their whole thing. So, like, she, and they quote in the piece Dominic Dunn, who was another one of these, he was a watcher of those socialites yeah. and the elite, you know. At least he did it with a, I think, with a saber kind of, um, and he ultimately, you know, segued into reporting on them as they were tried for murder and stuff like that, high-profile high trials. But um, it, it was that crowd, like Kirk Douglas and uh, those people who were absolutely A-listers at the time. And it all ended for Freddie de Cordova and Mrs. de Cordova in the early 90s because Freddie was off the show in 1992, I think. Oh, 
Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 I'll tell you, man, these are heart wrenching stories you're bringing up in the COVID era right now. (laughs) Um, I, I, you know what, you know, it would be funny if Anderson Cooper, if Anderson Cooper led with, before we get to the tragedy in Elmhurst Hospital in Queens, I'd like to talk a little bit of the update on Freddie the Corvette's wife. She <laughs> she is struggling to pay for a hot tub today. <laughs> I found I found the article. Listen to this. This is okay. Yes. Freddie DeCordova, again, the executive producer of tonight's show, did not believe in banks. He had been the son of a con man during the Great Depression. They went from first-class oh hotel God. to hotel with all their clothes oh, on their backs. Okay? My God. And according to reports, the fear of banks was so acute that he did not deposit money. He kept it stashed all over the house. So when Eddie says, you know, he made all that money, yeah, but and it's all literally all there in the house. Um, oh, Jesus. Wow. Yeah, he was a poor wow. money manager, it says. And I think they always feared for money because they spent like drunken sailors. I don't know whether uh, six figures were not enough. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I love reading about the really successful people who still are failures personally. I like that. Of course. Of course you Absolutely. do. I do too. It's great. It's Schadenfreude. It's Schadenfreude. And it's like, it just shows you that, you know, having success kind of means nothing even though i would like to experience it <laughs> we all would and and by the way she has this quote and this quote is revealing janet de yeah. was her name when you spend yeah. money people say how stupid yeah. you are especially later when you don't have it but if you don't spend it you don't enjoy it yeah and i think it's pretty stupid not to enjoy it that's a person who's headed to have no money right well i mean i think she's got a point and but there's moderation i guess you know yeah exactly moderation exactly if only eddie could have reached out to janet when it when it mattered <laughs> well, get a credit I, uh, card for god's sakes i uh i recently upgraded from artichoke hearts to hearts of tom and it's, i think it's yeah. foolish of me yeah don't get too extravagant this whole world of COVID 19 has brought a lot of things into focus for all of us you got to be careful um, <laughs> exactly well, anyway, that's the update on uh, Freddie de Cordova. Please make another reference so I can tell you about a Vanity Fair piece that I read. <laughs> right, uh, what the hell is I going was... on with W.C. Fields' children? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of not hey, trusting banks. I'll tell you, uh, we had we had oh, Norman right. Lloyd. Right. We had Norman Lloyd, the actor. He's 102 now. He was in the I Hitchcock. Think he played. I think he's like 100. Six now or something. I think- <laughs> it's Norman Lloyd. Norman Lloyd is 106. Me and Karen just watched. I guess he was on TCM a while ago. The guy's yeah. amazing. What about Norman? Yes, he, he speaks so well, and he, so he's on the show. Yeah, and he uh, was, you know, in Hitchcock's Saboteur. He was the Saboteur in Hitchcock's Saboteur. Anyway, uh, he was spoiler. in Chaplin's movies too. Right. Thank that's you. Right. And no, that the sets. Th- th- he's in Limelight. That was Limelight. Limelight. Yeah. No, oh, that's great yeah. knowledge. You guys are impressive. So, and it's oh. Chaplin that this story is about that he told. He told the story. He didn't tell the story on TCM. I love that we had something on the podcast that was not on TCM when he was. They chatted about all kinds of things. He said Charlie Chaplin told him that he had buried a million dollars in cash somewhere there on the premises. And, and he's telling oh. him this while he's in the garden. Charlie's in the garden with Norman. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Norman said, I started looking around going, hmm, I wonder where he would have <laughs> buried a million dollars. <laughs> Was that money ever recovered? So, so the wife, you know, they moved, of course, out of Hollywood, Charlie Chaplin. Uh, the wife of Charlie Chapman at his death returned mm-hmm. to Hollywood, and it was expressly for the purpose of getting the million dollars cash. Yes, it was recovered. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. Oh, man. That's, yeah. that's a pretty cool story. Wouldn't yeah. it be funny if Norman Lloyd was lying about his age and he's really 130? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I thought you were saying that. Cousin. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, 
Hey, when you watch the uh, briefings from Dr. Uh, Burks and Dr. Fauci, does it seem to you like you're getting the straight scoop or do you feel like they're watering it down for us now because, you know, Trump or the administration or political pressures are dictating certain things? Or do you think that, uh, you know, I feel like we got a real information problem because the information at the top feels like a lot it, diluted at best. Yeah, um, I feel like they're both scared of him. I think any I think, you know, he's such uh, he's such a. Uh, loaded gun or off the wall type of guy that uh, they're scared to like say something that directly contradicts them. And by the way, I have said this on stage, but I could get down with Trump if he like painted his face white and like cut his lips on the side and came on as the Joker and you know was just like <laughs> I'm thinking high story clip. I'm taking hydrochloric <laughs> and and the head of the CDC is like Dr. Faustus. You know what I mean? Like like just do fucking you know Marvel. That, that that way I could understand it better, or it would be clearer. Right. Well, I think in a way it is a cartoonish thing that we're living through. I mean, he is such a oh, an extreme in cartoon every way, character. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, it, it, I mean, you know, if you cast an incompetent president who ignores scientists and even as the world is imploding, you know, you have act one of a horror film, you have act one of all of these epic movies. It's cliche, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But I love that you could yeah. go steer so into the skid that you go with he absolutely becomes this cartoon guy. Yes. The, the thing about government, though, and this is the key, and I know that that was just a, a vision and it was a good vision, but here's the key. They drape everything in legitimacy. You understand that? Because they're guys with coats and ties. Oh, and, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's, the devi- that's the fucking devious part of it. And I actually find myself, and this is kind of a, you know, for me to admit this is embarrassing a little bit, but I, I see him, and my father's a narcissist, and I'll see Trump. My father's a clinical narcissist as well, and that's not to brag. I had that kind of upbringing. But... When Trump comes on, I mumble to myself, Daddy, Daddy, do good. Daddy, do good. Do good, Daddy. <laughs> I'm not You're kidding. Dead. I'm not You're kidding. Dead. We want these guys, we want yeah. these guys to lead us, even these at these shits, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. In fact, here's how bad it is. When he's saying this stuff about hydroxychloroquine or whatever it is, I always go, hmm. I wonder how much of that, maybe there is some truth to that. You know what I mean? Like, is there some, in other words, you do, you ascribe some authority to this authority, you know? Yeah, absolutely. How about you, Jay Elvis? Do you find any part of you, like, wanting, you know, this administration to not be as bad as it is? (laughs) Well, I mean, I want every part of me wants that. But yeah, I can't. Yeah. But but I don't have that. You know, I have a hundred percent. I see. I, it's, he's a hundred percent transparent to me, and it's all through the lens of narcissism. Mm-hmm. It's all through yeah. the lens lens of how do I look at this second to everybody? Yeah. yeah. And it never yeah. veers. It never strays unless he's unless he's really spe- like late, like today. You know, like the church thing was a laser pander. You know. But even that is a response to the polls, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. How fucked up is it that we get this guy, this guy somehow gets in office, and while he's in office, we have the biggest crisis we've had in 100 years or whatever it is. I mean, it's just too fucking surreal, right? Yeah, this is an overwhelming crisis, but I would suggest that even if it weren't this, he would have manufactured a crisis. In fact, I think he's going to get into a hot war with China right now. It's going to happen in the South China Sea. But I think this guy is... Really? He is, oh, well, yeah, that, he is if reckless. If that ever happens, we are so... I mean, I mean yeah. I'm mean, i willing to fight. You know, I'm 61, but I'm trained in all kinds of stealth, and um, I also... It must be really you know, stealth. <laughs> I would be in what would be called the overweight Navy SEALs division. <laughs> yeah, you don't hear much about them, really. But, uh, <laughs> I believe that's – No, I'm pretty sure that's all the Navy on Walrus. <laughs> the Navy Walrus. <laughs> the Navy Walrus. We're yeah. not as good. 
<laughs> that's a good one. That's the best line of the show so far. Yeah. But that. <laughs> Yeah, we're not as good as the Navy SEALs, but we're there. Man, we can open on. a can with our teeth. <laughs> <laughs> hey, come on. <laughs> okay, stop it. Jay Elvis is one of those comics who gets on a roll, and it's hard to stop. <laughs> Jay Elvis, uh, you know what he is? He's, right there. He's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a sharpshooter on the roof is what he is. Yep. He's just waiting. He's on yeah. the roof. He's the comedy sharpshooter. Yep. I do, I do have to say Wahlberg. that, unbeknownst to you, Eddie, I spent about a half hour of my podcast with Kindler arguing in your on your side of an argument with him. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. When he ended his friendship with you on Twitter over something yes. very innocuous, I, I called him out on it that night, and we spent half our podcast on that very topic. So. <laughs> Oh, I should listen to that. Is that is that up? Can I listen to that? Yeah, it's it's several episodes ago. I'll I'll try. I'll send you the uh, the yeah, episode send number. Me, send me the episode number. That was a hilarious online thing. You know, when that happened with Andy again, it made me go, oh, you know, online confrontation is just always so weird. You know, and can be yes. so so volatile. What was the confrontation ridiculous. over? It was. Uh, Andy, I don't remember the actual topic, but Eddie came back with said, Andy, you're too funny a person to be that big a moron, I think is what he said. That's and it was right. about a, it was a political That's point. Right. And yeah. Andy came yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and what, what we've determined since is that Andy's, like, magical trigger is calling him stupid because you immediately become his father. So, <laughs> it's, uh, yes. so that, hit, that, yes. hit, that hit his mm. trigger. And Andy came yeah. back with, I've known Eddie for 25 years, and I think he's one of the funniest men, but I must end our friendship with if he called me I know. moron. I know, I know. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, and, I, and, and I've seen him do this with so many people, but I was like, Andy, this is a good friend of yours. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah, thanks. thanks for that, because I think that brought him around, you know. It did, and, definitely uh, did. I also realized that, you know, Jesus, I shouldn't have said that. But I, well, you know what it's like when you're really into something political and you think someone is making a classical mistake. And someone, you, <laughs> yes. someone, you know is, someone you know is smart and right and you want them to be on your page. And I just realized you can't force people to be on your page. You just can't. Yeah. yeah, you know, it, I get this with Jimmy Dore, who's a who's a friend, and I really love Jimmy. Mm -hmm. He's a firebrand, and so he says a bunch of stuff, but I, I really don't agree with a lot of the things he says. You know, he's really an all-or-nothing kind of purist sort of guy, and so, mm -hmm. you know, that's part of his popularity. But, you know, I, I just have to hold my fire sometime because it can, you know, your head can explode. You just can't fight every battle, you know. Right, right, right. I'm more of a Jimmy Dore adherent, and... You know, because I like that all or nothing. Because what I think Jimmy is doing, and I don't mean to get into any kind of argument right now, but what I think Jimmy is doing is he holds the lesser than two evils to the fire as well. And I think that's... Yeah, yeah I mean, I, get, I totally get that. I, I understand. And I'm not saying that that's wrong. I think you can jihad your way into absolute irrelevance. <laughs> and, and so well, what happens, you know, because... That's interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is interesting. So, I got into a huge fight with Jimmy on our show about about uh, our show with Mark when he was Jill Steining his way through the last election, oh, yeah, you know, and, yeah. and, and equivocating Hillary and Trump. And I was just going, look, you can't fuck around mm -hmm. with Trump because I'm a Jew. I've been raised with never again my whole life. And mm. I've never seen more. I've never seen more signs of never again than this. I was right. And uh, bared out, especially in that point, as he's yesterday, he's at the Ford plant talking about Henry Ford's good bloodlines i guess that's the point you know to not vote for you can say the lesser of two evils i mean there's there's an evil here that is a, a real clear and present danger you know and well in the case of joe biden i when there's a field of candidates i was my jihad was to get biden out i didn't like him he's a corporate democrat he's mainstream he's right. you could call him virtually right. republican but he's not at all compared to what we've got in power. I mean, it's an absolute abomination what's happening. And you've got, I don't know that you're going to get, you, you may not get government back. You know, he's trying to undo the post office because he's trying to create a situation where you can't have mail-in ballots. He's holding federal money 
in in abeyance to, you know, to essentially threaten states that need that federal money if they use mail-in ballots? This is crazy. It's the executive run amok, I mean, by any standard. And to, to somehow put these two things in sort of equivalent categories is really, I think, to, to miss the point. Well, uh, the one thing you didn't mention there is as, you know, our government and country unravels, uh, Netflix has been getting better and better, and I think that's a nice palliative. <laughs> hey, did you see the uh, the trailer was really stupid? I thought so. I thought oh, this is going to be awful. The David Spade no. film. Have you seen that? This no. is kind of over. It looks like a. I don't. Like, I don't consider anything that David Spade does to be <laughs> worthy worthy of my attention even though he's a super nice guy i've you know worked with him in the comedy store a bunch but uh i just find him to be uh comedy light yeah i'd like yeah. to go one step further that mark you're, you're <laughs> saying that not only did you watch a david spade movie but you watched a horrible trailer for it and gave him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, well, you know what, Josh, and I am going to give you a smattering of applause on that uh, because I uh, appreciate the put down always. But actually, I I thought, oh, this is this is a BS teen comedy something stupid. It's going to be awful, and uh, I, should watch I was it. I wasn't going to watch it, but. Somebody said to me, hey, you know what was surprisingly fun was the new David Spade. I said, oh, really? Because I watched the trailer and I thought it was just kind of stupid. He said, no, 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 no. I really enjoyed it. And so I watched it and let me finish. I watched, (laughs) I fell asleep, unfortunately, because I can't stay awake for anything because I'm so exhausted now all the time because I can't sleep because the fucking world is on fire. And uh, I, uh, so I only saw the first 45 minutes. So for the first 45 minutes, I thought it was good. Oh, really? What is the film? What is the film? It's called uh, The Wrong Missy. Essentially, it's a he runs into this woman in the airport. Uh, he has he has this awful date with this woman uh, named Melissa. Sort of a, I guess. a meet cute situation. Yeah, it's a is it it's a high concept kind of thing. He runs uh, into you her. know. See, this is where me and you differ. Like you're <laughs> watching David Spade, The Wrong Missy, and I'm watching a documentary that is about people who are being tortured in Belarus. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, we yeah. are just so on opposite ends of the spectrum as far yeah, as... Yeah, yeah, you're more substantive, I, like I guess. My, well, no, I like my well, no, I, to be informative and painful. I would say <laughs> that you both you both come together in the area of self-abuse, though. <laughs> <laughs> I get what you did there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a smattering Absolutely. of applause. Absolutely. <laughs> Anything to promote, Eddie? Let's see. My Instagram Live podcast, 4 o'clock Monday through Friday. We've had some great guests, including the uh, wonderful Mark Thompson, yeah, who, uh, got some, who got some uh, really good feedback. Uh, also, how's your girlfriend, Mark? She's well. She's good. Why do you? Uh, oh, good, she, okay. She's love. She's she's a big Eddie Pepitone fan. She likes Eddie and Karen. Oh, good, 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 good. Yeah. Uh, yeah my no, problem here is that my uh, my sweet cat Charlie is dying, which is a sucky oh, situation. Oh my god! That's yeah, I really tough. love him too. That's it's really tough. tough. But but anyway, so I thought I'd bring uh, you down with that. It is hard to plug anything after that, but I'll try. <laughs> Um, my dog is sick. No. Um, <laughs> Are you no, appearing at any veterinary that. offices between now and the end of the month? I could <laughs> maybe see those shows. <laughs> uh, no, what else? Oh, yeah. My special, my special for the masses, my new stand-up special is coming out on all kinds of different platforms. You know, Amazon, I believe, iTunes, all these different platforms, June 23rd, and I'll have more about that, uh, you know, and you can follow me. Just go to EddiePepitone.com, and it'll have all that stuff. I love it. I love it. I look forward to that. Well, I know you got to get that uh, that dog into the he's car gotta, before the gotta, owner realizes gotta, that you're stealing it. Yeah, I was going to say, he has to finish killing that dog, so we should let him go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Better, better, better. We, uh, you see, I'm an amateur with the professionals. Eddie, I love that you made time. Thank you, man. Thank you, guys. Bye. Really love you. Bye, really Eddie. love you. You're great. Love yeah. you. Right. See you. I like you. Right. That was Eddie J. Elvis. Do you have anything that you want to plug? Are you uh, doing anything that we should know about? Not really. Your podcast. No, I got Soft Spiral once a week uh, coming out. Comes out Mondays with Andy Kindler and me. I got my album Chunks available on where albums are available, and I got a Michael DeBar. Who do you want me to be? Coming out July 10th. I love it. Great visiting with you. Let's talk soon. Next time, in fact.
J. Elvis Weinstein, everybody. And here's some applause that he hates. Thank you. Thank you. If you enjoy listening to The Edge, support them by subscribing to The Edge on iTunes, Stitcher, and you can listen through the iHeartRadio app. Get busy listening.